for the chain of the nervous system, right? So now I'm going to talk about the brain. So the brain, as you can see, it is part of the central nervous system. As you can see that the brain is one of the components of the central nervous system. So it is very important for you to be able to know each and every part of the brain. So here now we're going to focus in the human brain. Okay? So we're going to try to draw a little sketch about the top view of the human brain. So let's say this is the top view of the human brain. So as you can see that this top view or this brain is divided to the left and the right side. So the right side is known as the right hemisphere. And then the left part is known as the left hemisphere. Okay. So the brain, when we combine the right and the hemisphere, we try to, I mean, when we try to know and then we give them a single name, then we call them the cerebral, which is the very first part in the brain, and it is the largest part of the brain. Then, sorry, the cerebral. So the cerebral is the largest part of the brain. So it means that the left hemisphere is the cerebral and also the right hemisphere is the cerebral. Okay, and then we have this part known as cerebellum. So it's very important for you to not confuse these two parts. And then now we have this part that divides the brain into the left and the right hemisphere. So this part now we call it Corpus callosum. So it's, it's known as the corpus callosum. And then we have other parts that are deeper inside the brain that we cannot see them because of now here we're looking at the brain from the top. Okay, so the different parts of the brain that are not visible here in our diagram, we have the hypothalamus. Pichita gland, and then we also have Kevin right here. We also have the most common one called the medulla oblongata. So the medulla oblongata. The medulla oblongata is a very common part in the human brain that is known by people, even those who do into biology and life sciences, they know this part because they like, they like utilizing the name of oblongata. Maybe when they want to say you must use your brain to think, they say, use the medulla oblongata to think. There's a medulla way. Yeah, so that's what they, they say in Sizwa. Okay, so I'm going to try and discuss the functions of each and every part here. The brain is made up of many, many parts that are not taught in grade 12. So when you study neurology or neuroscience, which is the science that studies the nervous system, then you will find out that the brain is many parts and many systems inside of it. Okay? So when you want to learn mm, further actually about the brain, you can text me privately and I'll teach you other parts that are not here that are led by neurologists because of neuroscience is very, very interesting. Okay, so I'm going to start with the functions of the cerebral. So we want to know what are the functions of the cerebral. Okay, so I'm only discussing the main functions, guys. I'm not going to discuss all the functions. The main functions that we have to know for the 12. So the cerebral controls all voluntary actions. Okay? 
So we want to know what are the wrong predictions. Well, the predictions are predictions that you decide to do. When I walk like this, I have decided to walk. It means that it is a wrong prediction. When I talk, it is a wrong prediction. When I write here in the whiteboard, it is a wrong prediction because this action, I'm doing it, there's no one who's forcing me to do it. Okay. Now, another function is that it receives and interprets all sensations. So, what are sensations? When we talk about sensations, we are talking about light or maybe seeing something. Talking about touch, talking about hearing, hearing what? Hearing sound or whatever that you are hearing. Then, so those things are sensations and other sensations like taste. Okay. So it means that whatever that you see using your eyes, it is interpreted in the cerebral. The cerebral is the one that controls it. When somebody touches you, you're able to feel it, right? It is because of the cerebral was subjectivity and made it possible for you to know that. Even the case when you eat food, you are able to know that now I'm eating KFC or I'm eating whatever you're eating, pizza, chicken again. The cerebral is the one that makes you to be able to um, taste whatever you are eating. And then now we have another uh, function, the main function. This one it controls higher thoughts processes. So, what are higher thought processes? It means that this cerebral it is the main part, the major part in the brain that makes you, uh, I mean, that makes it possible for you to think. So it means that your thinking is controlled by the cerebral. When you want to think, you're using cerebral. So in other words, your intelligence it is in the cerebral. Okay? So that means that you are you to use the middle of the to think like people say. You use your cerebral. Okay. So I'm going to discuss the functions of the corpus callosa. So the corpus callosa, like I've said, it divides the brain into the left and the right hemisphere. After that, it makes it possible for this hemisphere, the left one, to communicate with the right hemisphere. Because it is very important for these two hemispheres to communicate with each other so that they, they can bring complete functions so that there cannot be confusion of the decision making inside the brain. So they have to communicate with each other. So the corpus comes up. It is a bundle of nerves. It means that the nerves they combine together to form this corpus callosa. And then these nerves they make it possible for communication to be facilitated between these two parts. So it divides the brain into two parts or two hemispheres. And then those hemispheres. They are able to communicate with other. Yeah. Makes it possible for, for these parts to communicate. Now we are moving to the functions of the cerebellum. What is the function of the cerebellum? So the cerebellum, uh, the cerebellum is different from the cerebral. You can see that it is smaller than the cerebral. So this one, it coordinates. So it coordinates all voluntary actions. What do we mean by coordination of actions? It means that it makes the actions to be in synchronization. So that we can be ordered in the actions that are done in the body. For example, walking. When I walk, my actions are coordinated. It means that when I walk, when I, I move forward, when my right leg goes forward, my left leg, 
I mean my left hand also goes forward. So there's coordination, there's coordination. I don't walk like this. This is my coordination. You see, I hope you understand. Okay. So another function of this part is that it maintains balance and equilibrium. Maintains balance and equilibrium. So what do we mean by maintaining balance and equilibrium? It means that the cerebral lung it is the one that is responsible for making sure that you do not fall when you walk. It means that the balance that we have when we walk it is because of this part, the cerebral lung. This part is able to send the impulses known as the messages to the muscles of the body so that the muscles can maintain balance. Maybe when you want to fall down, maybe there's a hole or something, a put hole or something, and now you want to fall down. And you are able to balance quickly. It's because of the cerebral lung was able to send the impulses or the messages to the muscles to maintain balance. Okay. Now I'm going to the hypothalamus. What are the functions of the hypothalamus? So the hypothalamus is the deeper part of the brain, it's not visible here. So this hypothalamus it controls first, then it controls first in the body, it controls first, it controls hunger, emotions. So it means that when you are thirsty, it is because of the hypothalamus who are stimulated by certain receptors instead of, of it. So those receptors they were able to notice that the body doesn't have water. So now the hypothalamus makes you aware that now you are thirsty, there's no water in your body. Go ahead and drink water. Okay? And then it controls hunger. When you are hungry, it's because of the hypothalamus was able to sense that the body doesn't have food or doesn't have enough food, so you have to eat. It's because of the hypothalamus. It controls also emotions. You are able to be happy, angry, sad, yeah, excited, whatever. It's because of the hypothalamus. It's responsible for controlling those emotions. Okay? For example, when you are happy, you are happy in love, actually. The love that you experience is not in the heart, it is in the brain. Where is the the brain? In the hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus is the part that makes you to be in love. Okay? Not your heart. <laughs> okay. So another function is that it controls the body temperature. So it means that now we are able to sense when it's cold outside or maybe when it's hot. It is because of the hypothalamus was able to say that was able to detect that uh, temperatures or those temperatures in Chani, the hypothalamus how the skin the skin was able to receive that particular sensation and then the hypothalamus was responsible for you I mean was responsible for making it uh, possible for you to sense that it's cold outside. Hope you understand. And then now we have the pituitary gland. I'm not going to discuss the functions of the pituitary gland because of you guys did them in the menstrual cycle. When we did the menstrual cycle, we were told that the pituitary gland secretes hormones, many hormones, follicular stimulating hormone, TSH, LH, and other hormones. So this one it secretes hormones. That is the function of the pituitary gland. You learn about other hormones when you do the endocrine system. It's another system that is able to make it possible for you to sense or respond to the environment. And then now we have the medulla oblongata, the most common one. So, the medulla oblongata, people like saying you must use your medulla oblongata to think and stuff. And this part has nothing to do with thinking. So, what is the function of the medulla oblongata? So, I'm going to write a function here. So, the medulla oblongata. Controls all involuntary actions. So, what are involuntary actions? Involuntary actions are 
patients that you do not have to think about in order for you to do them. They just happen automatically. Okay? So the examples of those actions we're talking about the heartbeat. We are talking about the breathing rate. We're talking about blinking of your eyes. Okay? And other inverted actions that you can think of in your body. Okay? Those actions are controlled by the block of the gut. It means that now your heartbeat, in order for your heart to be able to beat, is because of the block of the is able to send the electrical impulses or the messages to the heart so that the heart can beat. Even breathing rate, the block of the is responsible for sending the electrical impulses to the lungs, to the intercostal muscles, and to the diaphragm of your lungs so that they can make breathing possible for you. So breathing you can you can stop the breathing temporarily, maybe when you are swimming, but then after that it's a must for you to breathe because of the blood of that become stimulated. Okay. And then also the blinking of your eyes. You can stop your blinking for some seconds, but then after that you have to blink because of it is a involuntary action. Okay, so I hope you guys understood this part and then their functions and then how they fit in the brain and then the functioning of your body. I hope you understood that part. Okay.